Hey everyone, what's up? So in this video, we'll be talking about from the ground up, very intuitively, what does it mean to take the inverse of a matrix? And so we'll be working with a very simple example in this video, which is this. Let's say that you have just started a band. And let's say that in January and February of last year, these were your profits for two different categories that related to your band. Let's say your band plays concerts and you sell tickets, and that's one source of profit. And the other is merchandise. So if you sell a nice snazzy t-shirt with your band's logo on it, that goes into the merchandise category. So the way you interpret this very simple two by two table is that last January, we made $3,000 worth of profit in tickets and $1,000 worth of profit in merchandise. And the February numbers read very similarly. So now let's continue the story. And let's say that now it is this year. So this data again was from last January and February. And we are expecting some change in our profits in terms of these two categories, tickets and merchandise. And the question we want to answer first is that how much profits would we expect in both this January and this February if the current profit in each of these categories was multiplied by some factor? And those factors are collected in this vector f. So specifically how you read this is that maybe we're expecting that this time around we're only going to make 70% as much profit from our ticket sales and we're only going to make, unfortunately, 10% as much profit from our merchandise sales. Now, just a quick note, the numbers that are in this vector can be positive or negative. If they're negative, we're interpreting that as actually losing money, so a negative profit. And if they're positive, then we're going to explain that as we still have some kind of positive profit. But the more positive the number, the higher the profit is versus the previous January and February. So again, coming back, we're trying to figure out what is the profit I'm going to make this January and February if, for example, the multipliers are 0.7 and 0.1. It turns out that to get that answer, we can just multiply. So we can do this matrix vector multiplication of P, which is this two by two matrix of data from last year, with F, which collects the factors we're applying to the profits for each of these two categories. And just a quick sanity check, why does this work? Why is it that multiplying this matrix with this vector will give me the answer I'm looking for? Well, let's look at how we compute the result. So the result, the first entry of it is the dot product of the first row of P, which is three and one, with the vector F. And that makes sense because we're saying three times 0.7. So that first part of the story is saying that this is the January profit from tickets and I'm multiplying that by the factor that I believe it's going to get adjusted by, which is 0.7. And then I add that to the January profits for merchandise, which is one, times the factor that I'm expecting that category to get adjusted by, which is 0.1. And so that's exactly how I get this 2.2. And that's saying that if these were the multipliers, then I would be expecting to make $2.2,000 in terms of profits this January. And same story for February. That's taking the dot product of the bottom row with the same vector f, and that's how we get the 1.5. So again, I just want to pause and make sure we understand. P is a very simple two by two matrix of profits from previous January, February, and also by the two different categories that we're making money in. And f is a vector which can contain positive, negative, any number at all. And these are the multiplying factors on these two different categories, so that the result vector, which I'm calling little m for money, couldn't think of a better name really, uh, this little m vector is going to collect how much profit we expect to make this January and February. Okay, so let's think about this in a little different way. We know that this matrix vector multiplication makes sense. So P times F is equal to M. We just showed that right now. But let's reframe the way we're thinking about this problem so that it's going to naturally lead into the inverse question. The way we're going to think about this problem is as a input-output machine. And the input is this vector F and the output is this vector little m. And the way we get from the input to the output, the vehicle or the machine, or more importantly, the linear transformation that gets us from the input to the output is exactly this matrix P. So another way to tell that in more of a storytelling kind of way is that I'm not exactly sure what the factors are going to be. So I said 0.7 and 0.1 here just kind of to try something out, but they could be any number of things. So I want to kind of treat this as a problem where if I pick any factors, which are collected in this vector f, then I want to have a function which is going to map those factors to the literal dollars in profit that I'm going to make this January and February. And that's exactly how we're thinking about it down here. The factors are the input. The way we get from the input to the output is using this matrix P. And the output itself is the dollars in profit we're expecting to make this January and February. 
which is this vector little m. Now that we framed it that way, we can very naturally form the inverse question, which is, let's say that I have a target number of dollars of profit that I want to be making this January and February. So that is to say, actually now I have an idea about what m should be. For example, let's say that we have a target dollar profit, which is 2.2 and 1.5. Now the inverse question is asking, what do the multipliers on the profit need to be? So what do the entries of this f vector need to be in order for me to achieve that m that I'm currently thinking of? And that's exactly what I've written up here. So we're saying, is there an inverse operation? Is there a way that if I do know m, or if I do have an idea about how much profit I want to be making this January and February, is there some different matrix v which is going to allow me to map that m to what the factors would need to be. Okay, so make sure that idea makes sense. Again, this whole video is not about the math at all. This video is just about what inherently does the inverse operation mean. So a matrix, as we know, maps some vector to some other vector. The inverse operation is saying, if I have that other vector, if I have the output, is there a way for me to map back to the input which led to that output? So pretty much the same thing as an inverse function, which you might have studied in your early algebra classes. So now let's continue on here. We're saying, is there some V which is going to achieve this mapping for me? If that were the case, so let's say this V is given by A, B, C, D. So V is a two by two matrix whose entries are A, B, C, and D. And we're asking that, is there a two by two matrix V such that if I multiply this M vector, which contains M1 and M2, that it leads to the factor vector, which is F1 and F2. So this is exactly the matrix vector multiplication form of this much simpler looking function form up here. Now we can actually continue because we know that the m vector, where have we seen that before? We know that the m vector is equal to p times f. So we can actually just plug in the m vector as p times f, which is this guy, which is p, and then we have f right here. The reason we did that, now we have a f on the left hand side and we have a f all by itself on the right hand side. And what this is telling me is that if I multiply these two matrices together, again, the first one being V, this unknown inverse operation that I'm trying to solve for, and the next one being P, which is the original matrix that we were looking at in the beginning of this video, if I multiply those two matrices together, I better get the identity matrix. And why better I get the identity matrix? The reason for that is that the only matrix which is going to be able to map F to itself, no matter what F is, no matter what the entries of F actually are, would be the identity matrix. Any other matrix, any other two by two matrix you can think of, will not achieve this transformation for every possible F. So I need for these two guys to multiply together to be the identity matrix. And once I have made that logical step, it becomes pretty easy to solve for the entries of A, B, C, and D, because I just do this matrix multiplication, which leads me here. And I know that that must be equal to the identity matrix. And then I won't solve it for you here, but you can pretty easily solve for A, B, C, and D so that you get that this V, this mystery inverse operation that I was trying to solve for the entire time, must be equal to 1, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. And now we can actually write this as what it's commonly written as in all your textbooks and lectures and notes, which is that this matrix is equal to P inverse. I didn't call it P inverse from the start because I really wanted to treat it as its own operation. This is a matrix which allows me to map from M to F, whereas P was a matrix that allowed me to map from F to M. But now that we see that logical connection, how they're related, I can now share with you that this matrix is actually P inverse. And the reason we call it P inverse is because it achieves the inverse operation. It takes the input output problem we had here flips it on its head and takes the outputs and maps them back to their inputs. So just to really hit this home, I really want to make this super clear. This matrix that we derived here allows us to do the following very cool thing. We can now take any potential profit. So we're saying, I want to be making this much profit in January and this much profit in February of this year. What do my factors need to be? What does this factor vector need to be in order to make that happen? This matrix is able to answer that question. Okay, so that's what the inverse operation intuitively means. And now to close this video out, I want to do something a little different. I want to talk to you about why does it only make sense to talk about the inverse of square matrices. So you might have been told up front in your linear algebra course that, oh, only square matrices have inverses, or you might read it in a textbook, or you might only ever be assigned homework problems where you're taking the inverse of square matrices. So it might just be kind of an obvious thing in your head, 
But if you think about it a little bit further, the way we've intuitively defined the inverse operation here, nothing about this is screaming must be square. So where does this notion come from? And I want to kind of talk about that to close the video so you truly understand what it means to take the inverse of a matrix and when you can do it, when you can't do it. Before I do that, I want to do kind of a little experiment, which might seem unrelated at first, but is going to tie together really nicely into the whole idea. So let's say that we have some kind of space of vectors here. So A, B, C, D, and E is some space of vectors. Each of these letters is a vector. Okay? And let's say that we define some smaller part of this space called the small space. And the small space is just A and B. So that's the green little dashed thing right here. Now we want to ask a series of three questions. So for each question, we're going to be defining some kind of mapping or some kind of function between these vectors and some other set of these vectors. So the first question we're going to ask is, is there a mapping that goes from the small space, again, the space of just A and B, to the small space? So again, the space of A and B. So the input and output are both just the small space. Is there a mapping between those two spaces for which an inverse operation can exist. And I know everything I've said just seems really theoretical, but let me try to break it down for you. So we know our input space is A and B. We know our output space is also A and B. We're saying, is there some kind of mapping between these inputs and these outputs such that I can form a inverse operation? Now let's say I define the mapping as follows. A maps to B and B maps to A. Is an inverse possible in this case? Yes, absolutely, because if you give me B, I can map it back to a single input. So remember, going back to your algebra course, an inverse only exists if given an output, you can map that back to a single input. And we can do that in this case because B maps back to A and A maps back to B. Now, it's also possible not to have this happen. For example, let's say we define the function as follows. A and B both map to B. Now, if I try to define an inverse in this case, I would say that what does B map back to? Well, I don't have a clear answer. There's two things that led to B. So in this case, the inverse is not possible. And so in this case, we say that it is possible to have an inverse operation. So we say that an inverse can exist. And if it exists, it has to be unique. And to see why it's unique, take a look at this first example again. And if I ask you, what does B map back to? There's no other answer you could have given me than A. There's no other possible answer. And if I ask you what A maps back to, there's no other possible answer but B. So for that reason, if we're mapping from the small space to the small space, then an inverse exists and it's unique. Now let's think about this. What if we're mapping from the whole space, which I'm calling all, so all is A, B, C, D, and E. If I'm mapping from the whole space to the small space, then how do we answer this question? The whole space is again A, B, C, D, and E and the small space is just A and B. Let's say I map A to B. Okay, fine. Let's say I map B to A, no problem. Now it comes time to map C to something. You might see where the issue is gonna come in. If I map C to A, then an inverse cannot exist because then B and C both point to A, we're out of luck. So maybe I map C to B, same exact problem. Now we have A and C both pointing to B and the inverse cannot exist. So very interestingly enough, we see that if we're trying to come up with some any function, any function at all that maps from the big space to a smaller space, the inverse cannot exist. And again, if you're zoning out right now and you're wondering what this has to do with matrix inverses, just hold on one second. This is all going to tie together. And we're going to look at the last case, which is we're going to map from the small space to the big space. So again, that's mapping from A and B, the small space, to the big space, which is A, B, C, D, and E. We see the inverse can comfortably exist in this case. For example, let's say that we map A to A. Let's say that we map B to C. And then we ask for every possible output, can we give one input that led to it? Yes. If I give you A, you can tell me that A was the one who led to that. If I give you C, you can map that back to B. So an inverse can absolutely exist. Just a quick side note, of course, we can always get into this problem where it doesn't exist, but we're just trying to show that it is possible for it to exist. So the inverse can exist, but the interesting thing here is that it's not unique. And the reason it's not unique is because look at B, D, and E. Nothing mapped to them. And the reason is that the output space was just bigger than the input space in some sense. So because nothing mapped to them, I pretty much have free reign to map them back to anything I want. 
for example, when it comes to the inverse operation and you ask me, where should I map B to? I can just arbitrarily say A or B. If you ask me where to map D to, I can just arbitrarily say either one. Same thing with E. So although an inverse exists, there's many different inverses that could exist in this case. I can map the unmapped elements back to whatever I want, and I still satisfy the conditions to be an inverse. Now comes the part where I explain to you why I did all this. Why I did all this is because this framework, as long as you understand it, is going to perfectly be the same understanding for knowing which shape of matrices are going to give you inverses, which are never going to give you inverses, and which are going to give you inverses which may have many different solutions. So let's draw a very parallel picture down here. So this picture is meant to be a parallel of this picture here, except now the whole space is R3. R3 is every triple of numbers, so it's just a three vector. Now the important thing to know is that R2, R again being real numbers, 2 being that this is a pair of real numbers, is a subset of R3. And let me just do a quick note. For all of you pure math people watching this, this might be a little bit cringy because I am dealing with infinite spaces and here it was finite, but just know that the same exact logic applies and you can come up with your own rigorous arguments, but that's not the point of this video. So we have R2 being a subspace of R3, which is saying that every pair of numbers is a specific case of every triple of numbers where the last element is vanished or set to zero. So I want you to take this R2, the same logical framework as the subspace, and R3, the same logical framework as the whole space. And now let me ask you the question, what does it mean to have a square matrix? For example, if I have a two by two square matrix here, that matrix job is to map vectors in R2 to another vector in R2. That lands us right back at this case where we're mapping from the small space to the small space. And we know that in that case, an inverse can exist. And if it does, then it's unique. And this perfectly answers the question about why we care so much about square matrices when it comes to inverses. Because for square matrices, if the inverse exists, like for example, in this case, then it's unique, which means that it makes sense to ask about the inverse of a square matrix, not a inverse of a square matrix, for example. That's why we care so much about inverses of square matrices. And to close this video, let's look at the other two cases. So if we look at a long matrix, so one that looks like this, this, for example, maps R3 to R2. And that is analogous to mapping the whole space to the small space. In this case, an inverse cannot exist, okay? So if you're dealing with a long matrix where it is longer than it is tall, then an inverse cannot exist at all. And the final, maybe more interesting case, is if you're looking at a tall matrix, this is mapping, for example, R2 to R3. And that would land us back at this case where you're mapping from a smaller space to the whole space. You're mapping from the small space to the whole space. This is the case where an inverse can exist, but it is not unique if it does exist. So that's the reason that although this kind of case does have an inverse, it could potentially have many inverses. And that's why we don't talk so much about this case because when we say the inverse of a matrix that looks like this, it's a little unclear what exactly we're talking about. So um, just a quick note, although I was dealing with R2 and R3 here, just know that you can swap out these numbers for whatever you want as long as you're keeping the shape of the matrix the same. So as long as one dimension is bigger than the other dimension in these two cases. And in this case, the two dimensions are equal. So what I really wanted to get across in this video is what does it intuitively mean to take the inverse of a matrix? I know that we have little formulas for two by two and three by three matrices of, oh, just plug in these things and you got yourself an inverse. But I don't think that helps in really understanding linear algebra and going forward data science, machine learning, all these topics. I think it really helps to think about the inverse operation as kind of a undoing of the operation that you did in the first place. And it also really helps to think about which matrices, which linear transformations have the potential to have an inverse, which ones do not, and which ones that if they do have an inverse, are they unique, okay? So I hope you learned kind of from the ground up about inverses in this video. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos just like this. Uh, any comments are totally welcome below and see you next time.